Hello, welcome back. Today we're going to revisit our old friend Crowton T and review the last in his recent series on race realism. Its title is The Alt-Right is Too Dumb for Quantitative Genetic and it seems to be the ultimate effort in Kraut's magnum opus. He is joined in this enterprise by several scientists. That term I use loosely. Kraut's efforts have not gone unchallenged. The most surprising thing is he seems impervious to any and all criticism. After a two-month hiatus, he uploaded the third video in his series. And what surprised me, and I think a lot of other people, is that after all the criticism he had received relating to his first and second videos, he simply doubled down. And while his content had improved, the basic arguments he presented remain unchanged. I have watched several YouTubers respond to Kraut and T's efforts, all of which address Kraut's position either directly or indirectly. If you are interested in a detailed refutation of Kraut's arguments, then I recommend you watch all three, because collectively they offer an effective and comprehensive rebuttal of Kraut's entire project. The first is the biologist Jean-Francois Guerapy. He offers a detailed point-by-point -point technical response to Kraut's videos. Next is a live stream by Teal Deer and Bunny Blackwell. They touch on every topic that is relevant to the discussion, and it's well worth a listen. This live stream, by the way, was brought to my attention by Shuttlecock on Twitter. Last but not least is a video by The Justicar, titled Kraut Does a Not Science. I recommend this video because Justicar defines the race realist position very well. The lesson here, I suppose, if you want a problem defined, ask a mathematician. The videos will be linked in the description box below. It should go without saying that you should view the response videos made by alternative hypothesis to Kraut's criticism of his work. Because of the personal nature of Kraut's criticism, it should not be assumed that he presents the content of alternative hypothesis fairly, so it is essential that you listen to the responses made by alternative hypothesis before reaching any conclusion. His channel will also be linked in the description box below. I think it fair to say that Kraut's efforts have not been well received in some circles, and his videos have been subject to comprehensive and cogent criticism. So you might be asking yourself, what is there left to say about the matter? In this video, I would like us to approach the topic from a slightly different perspective. We will try to avoid going over the points made elsewhere, and that does leave us with a few issues we can take a look at, because Kraut and the League of Extraordinary Scientists are a gift that just keeps on giving. They provide us, perhaps unwittingly, with an endless adventure. So let's begin. Newspaper articles as a source. However, in STEM, speculation without evidence is nothing but worthless. And there are strict rules to source every single claim that is made. And since these videos are by now made with the help of actual STEM researchers and academics, it comes without saying that I have eventually resigned to put myself under the same standard of work for these videos that they would require and are happy with. In short, that means that the typical anti-social justice video with sources, if existent at all, being some newspaper articles, will not work here. Every claim made on a scientific basis must, under all circumstances, be sourced. And what differentiates sources in STEM from sources one puts forward in politics is that source lists are incredibly long. To quote a Dutch chemistry student who helped me with the work on this video, If I hand in a paper that only has seven sources, people will look at me and ask, is this supposed to be a joke? I will not read it. I advise you to try this yourself. Take your time and stroll through various biology and chemistry papers on asm.org, embopress.org, pub Med, Angevante Chemie, Nature, or the US National Library for Medicine. You will find that every paper has 30, 50, or even over a hundred sources. Every little detail must be backed up, not by surveys and social studies, but by cold, hard lab results. Now we pause here because the simple fact of the matter is, we're not publishing scientific papers here on YouTube. When was the last time you read a scientific paper authored by a railway gun, a cartoon cat, a guy without a head and a bloody steam engine? So let's drop all this pretentious nonsense. We're not comparing like to like. Of course providing references is always a good idea, but the purpose they serve is different. Very few people watching your video crowd would be capable of narrowing down the relevant publication by your use of a particular term. No one is going to search through all your citations because they have an issue with your video, because you have failed to link the references to particular sections or statements within the video. This renders their use 
purely ornamental. Unless the viewer has at least some expertise relating to the topic, without linking citation to specific statement, you leave yourself open to the accusation of simply employing the wall of text technique, and that kraut would be a fair criticism. In one point in the video, he mentions that an effect size in a study in an article he's talking about is so small that it must fall within the margin of error. But if you read the abstract, you'll find that no, there's a positive effect size with a 95% confidence interval in all three of the conditions analyzed. I have read that study. The methodology is questionable, the results are questionable, and they even admit to it in that very paper itself. And far more importantly, it is, like all your sources, a genome-wide study. In case you don't know what this means, it means they do not conduct any gene analysis, protein analysis, or any other research that would actually determine the function and expression of genes. Listen, I think I did a good enough job underlying this in the last video, but I'll do it again here for the slow ones. The problem with the study is not with its math. The problem with the study is that it is only math. The methodology is questionable. The results are questionable. And they even admit to it in that very paper itself. Oh, really? How many papers have you read where the authors admit to using questionable methodology or have admitted that their results are questionable or that their data is nonsense? How many, Kraut? Okay, we might have a world's first, so let's have a look at these dire examples of scientific legermain you use in support of your statement. So, we have nothing. There is nothing here that supports your conclusion, Kraut. Where is the reference to methodology? Where are the questionable results? Is it the use of guarded terms, such as may or might, that offend your sensibilities? Is it the caveats? Kraut. Is that the problem? You claim questionable methodology, then simply move on as if it's a fact. You claim the results are questionable, but you don't trouble yourself to explain why. Do you really expect people to take you seriously if this is a typical example of your scientific insight? Apparently, I don't understand what quantitative genetics are, and apparently a PhD research geneticist also doesn't understand what quantitative genetics are. And all types argument in this video of his, basically summarized, is that we do not need all this research stuff that biologists do. We don't need gene expression studies, protein analysis, and knockout studies, and histological research. All that laboratory work that all those scientists do yeah, screw that. All we need is quantitative genetics and psychologists to make conclusions about biology. Right, it's, it's, it's a field, okay? And what these people are doing, Kraut and this chem savant guy, is they're denying either the existence or the validity of an entire field. I mean, often you'll see people saying that their opponents are anti-science, and that's just sort of a, you're dumb, I'm smart talking point. But in this regard, I can say that these two goobers are literally against an entire field of research. Well, interesting point. The problem is, as far as I can tell, alternative hypothesis is not saying that molecular biology is irrelevant, but that quantitative genetics is still relevant, and perhaps in some areas of research, perhaps more relevant than molecular genetics. They are complementary fields of study, Kraut. You either misunderstand the position taken by alternative hypothesis, or you're strawmanning. Let's see if I can put it another way. In practice, quantitative geneticists are able to identify candidate genes for a particular trait that molecular geneticists will seek to identify. That is, they identify that part of the genome that corresponds to the candidate gene. And while we're on the topic, what is a gene in the first place? And would the field of genetics grind to a halt if we could not sequence the genome, which seems to be the major implication in your argument. Let's take a look at the work of Thomas Morgan and his relationship with fruit flies, and let's touch lightly on the issue surrounding the problems of instrumentality and scientific observation along the way. Thomas Morgan was one of the founders of genetic. He gives his name to the center Morgan, which is the unit used to indicate distance between positions on chromosomes. A point to note is that when Morgan began his work on genetic, the most powerful instrument available to biologists at that time was the microscope. Yet Morgan won the Nobel Prize in 1933 for his discoveries, which included the description and role that the chromosome played in heredity. The structure of the chromosome was not discovered until 1953, 
when its internal structure was determined by Watson and Crick. Yet working with a humble fruit fly, Morgan had successfully mapped specific genes without knowing the true structure or even composition of DNA. We know he was successful in this because when we compare his proposed loci, they match those found using modern sequencing methods. The point here is that the quantitative methods developed by early geneticists like Morgan actually work. They are foundational. The problem with Kraut, and perhaps more worrying, the issue with his scientific collaborators, is for some reason, as yet undetermined, they seem ignorant of how scientific discovery and research proceeds. Kraut believes that science rests purely on deductive methods, and this is simply not the case, and never has been. Hypotheses cannot be constructed by deductive methods, for the simple reason it does not account for the novel. To develop a hypothesis, you necessarily engage in inductive reasoning, or more often than not, abductive reasoning, particularly in fields such as biology, Abductive reasoning is also known, more commonly, as inference to the best explanation. Are there any well-known examples of this type of reasoning in science? Well, yes, indeed there are. Evolution, the Higgs boson, relativity, quantum chromodynamics, the list is endless. Listen now to Richard Feynman, who was awarded the Nobel Prize in 1965 for his work in quantum electrodynamics, as he touches on this very topic. Situation. Now I'm going to discuss how we would look for a new law. In general, we look for a new law by the following process. First, we guess it. <laughs> then we com well, don't laugh, that's the really true. Then we compute the consequences of the guess to see what, if this is right, if this law that we guessed is right, we see what it would imply. And then we compare those computation results to nature. Or we say compared to experiment or experience compare it directly with observation to see if it, if it works. <coughs> if it disagrees with experiment, it's wrong. And that simple statement is the key to science. It doesn't make any difference how beautiful your guess is, it doesn't make any difference how smart you are who made the guess, or what his name is. If it disagrees with experiment, it's wrong. That's all there is to it. It's therefore not unscientific to take a guess, although many people who are not in science think it is. For instance, I had a conversation about flying saucers some years ago with Lehman. Because <laughs> I'm scientific, I know all about flying saucers. So I said, I don't think there are flying saucers. So the other, my antagonist said, is it impossible that there are flying saucers? Can you prove that it's impossible? I said, no, I can't prove it's impossible. It's just very unlikely. That, they say, you are very unscientific. If you can't prove it impossible, then why, how can you say it's likely that it's unlikely? Well, that's the way that is scientific. It is scientific only to say what's more likely and less likely and not to be proving all the time possible and impossible. To define what I mean, I finally said to him, listen, I mean that from my knowledge of the world that I see around me, I think that it is much more likely that the reports of flying saucers are the result of the known irrational characteristics of terrestrial intelligence <laughs> rather than the unknown <laughs> rational efforts of extraterrestrial intelligence. <laughs> it's just more likely, that's all. And it's a good guess. And we always try to guess the most likely explanation, keeping in the back of the mind the fact that if it doesn't work, then we must discuss the other possibility. The simple fact of the matter, Kraut, is easy to grasp. Theoretical physicists did not put their work on the standard model on hold while they waited for the experimental physicists to confirm the existence of the Higgs boson. Because that would be silly, wouldn't it, Kraut? And while we are pondering the Higgs, bear in mind, no one has ever seen one, and it's unlikely that anyone ever will, nor are they likely to bottle one in a jar. The evidence for the Higgs is statistical. It's the result of millions of trials over months and years. The evidence for its existence is a statistical anomaly, a blip on a graph where the theory predicted it would be. No one will be able to show you a Higgs boson crowd. Your position in relation to such matters is total bollocks, and your scientific collaborators should have told you as much, which leaves one wondering, why didn't they? 
Let's break this down to show how stupid it is. He is literally comparing a controlled environment where we decide the mating habits of plants and animals to the chaotic and unpredictable environment of nature, as if they were equal. Even worse, he seems to believe that traits such, let's give as an example, the size of eggs laid by chicken species are comparable to complex traits such as intelligence, thereby setting up a completely false comparison. You can breed domesticated animals for specific purposes by observing the results in, for example, how much milk output a cow species has, egg output, meat output, etc, etc. A process of experimentation that is called selective breeding and has been done since the dawn of humankind with domesticated animals and crops. But can you do that for intelligence? And can you do that for human beings? Where is the supposed selective breeding of human beings happening? Where is the selective breeding with the intention of isolating supposedly heritable intelligence traits happening? Intelligence is a complex trait that is substantially influenced by environmental environmental factors. As such, this idea that you can observe heritability of intelligence on the same basis as you can, for example, prove the heritability of variation egg sizes by chickens is frankly ridiculous. Okay, that pretty much demonstrates Kraut's grasp of evolutionary theory. Let's talk dogs, people and natural selection. When we look at these two terms, Kraut, what changes between them? We have artificial selection and Natural selection. No rush. Think about it. If you want a clue, both contain the words selection. It's the type of selection that changes. Both processes are the same. The only difference is the type of selection. In dogs, it is we who select for particular traits. For humans, it is largely environmental, although there are other selection pressures in play as well. But that explanation is good enough for government work. Let's look at a real-world example. And different eyes. Yeah, yeah, one eye is... Yeah. Yeah, it's more thing, I think. What type of animal is this? Well, actually, it's a fox. It's been bred for traits that make it friendly to humans. What was unexpected and surprised the researchers was that the more they bred for domesticated traits, the more dog-like the foxes became. This change was achieved over several generations. The original research on foxes was conducted in Russia. But if we consider dogs, as Richard Dawkins pointed out in a tweet, and I quote, From an evolutionary point of view, pedigree dog breeds are islands, gene pools separated not by geography, but by human rules. The key phrase here is rules. Dawkins also made the same point in his book, The Greatest Show on Earth. So that's my explanation, Kraut. Selection is different in each case, but the process is the same. Because humans determine the rules, they can get the traits they desire in dog and fox. But it's the same evolutionary process at work for human, dog and fox. The same can also be said of micro and macro evolution. There is no fundamental difference. It is only a matter of temporal and physical scale. But it is the same process driving both. And yes, Kraut, it is well established that geographically separated populations develop different variations in trait. And that would include the emergence of identifiable biological subgroups. No matter how uncomfortable that may make you feel. What we have here is a set of nested taboos. Human intelligence itself is a taboo topic. People don't want to hear that intelligence is a real thing, and that some people have more of it than others. They don't want to hear that IQ tests really measure it. They don't want to hear that differences in IQ matter, because they're highly predictive of differential success in life. And not just for things like educational attainment and wealth, but for things like out-of-wedlock birth and mortality. People don't want to hear that a person's intelligence is in large measure due to his or her genes, and that there seems to be very little we can do environmentally to increase a person's intelligence, even in childhood. It's not that the environment doesn't matter, but genes appear to be 50 to 80 percent of the story. People don't want to hear this, and they certainly don't want to hear that average IQ differs across races and ethnic groups. Now, for better or worse, these are all facts. In fact, 
there is almost nothing in psychological science for which there is more evidence than these claims about IQ, about the validity of testing for it, about its importance in the real world, about its heritability, and about its differential expression in different populations. Again, this is what a dispassionate look at decades of research suggests. Whatever the difference in average IQ is across groups, you know nothing about a person's intelligence on the basis of his or her skin color. That is just a fact. There is much more variance among individuals in any racial group than there is between groups. So, besides being unethical and politically imprudent, it is totally irrational to treat people as anything other than individuals. Murray and Hernstein were absolutely clear about this in the bell curve. So, what happened to Murray, as far as I can tell, has had nothing to do with errors of scholarship, of which, undoubtedly, there must be some, or for the way he's conducted himself since, or for his personal motives for discussing these topics in the first place. Rather, his scapegoating has been entirely the result of his having merely discussed differences in human intelligence at all. Now, it's certainly true that the definitions of both intelligence and race are open for debate, to some degree. And there can be cultural influences in the concepts we use that we don't totally understand. But the efforts to invalidate the very notions of general intelligence and race have been wholly unconvincing from a psychometric and biological point of view, and are obviously motivated by a political discomfort in talking about these things, on points about which there is virtually no scientific controversy. We end our adventure at this point. I hope you found something of interest in this video. If you would like to support my channel, I now have a Patreon page. If you're unable to support my work through Patreon, then you can share, like, or comment. It's all good. Thank you for watching. <laughs>